Why did the last renaissance succeed? It didn't succeed. Um, it succeeded because it used this new technology, which is decentralized. And what do I mean by that? Well, they could share finance, but they could also share these ideas at a glimpse. And so most of the idea sharing and the ideas that said, hey, there's a possibility of something new that you haven't considered, and here's here's a, a blueprint for following that or for experimenting with it, was communicated in the form of an image. And an image, you know, an image isn't just the art historian say, hey, it, <laughs> It's not just an image, it, it means something, it signifies something, right? If you see a bee, it means Bitcoin. If you see the diamond, it means Ethereum. Maybe if you see the, the flag or something, these images have symbols and they have like meaning behind them. So the idea of charging an image with symbolism and not just any symbolism that stirs emotive feelings, but that actually represents community, right? And so these like images, if you think through all the images you're surrounded with today that we take for granted, these images actually mean community. And they might even communicate very specific like narratives or stories. If you see an image of money printer go burr, I mean, you know what that means, right? That's you know something specific. And so an image of these things, you're not just looking at an ape, you're not just looking at a punk, you're, you're seeing something that means like, hey, there's value and rights and other fundamentals, but we're expressing it with a silly image, which, you know, to us moderns, that sounds silly. You're looking at this picture and saying that's ridiculous, but that that was the history of the Renaissance. When we think of the Renaissance, we think of, you know, Botticelli and Michelangelo <clears throat> and David and the Sistine Chapel, but that wasn't what transformed the society. That wasn't what medieval you would have seen. You would have seen something that looked very much like a cartoon character, right? Like on this woodcut, it would have been a block based, you know, cut a piece of wood, stamp it and print it. And it's very low brow. It's very, you know, it's very flat and it's an image it's almost like a logo and that logo had you know amazing power behind it because it it, it was recreating the fundamentals of one's mental world view and we're doing the same thing today with the addition of not just recreating the fundamentals of one one's world view but that image isn't just semiotic in nature it also has this mimetic or this value-based charge as well as it actually serves a specific function. You can use it as collateral. You can use the object as right. So anytime you have complex systems with communities, you always have these objects of sociality that act as vectors for creation. But this time, it actually has value baked in. So at the last Renaissance, you had money, and money would allow you to go do the printing and what have you. And the images you saw in the printing, you know, it required capital, obviously. But it said, hey, the money system could split, politics could split, work could split. This time, you actually have the technology baked in it, not just at one layer like last time, but in both layers. So it's, yeah, they're experiments and they're silly cartoons, but that's precisely, that's precisely the stuff that tends to work out in history. It's, it's kind of counterintuitive, which gets to the other idea is that, you know, most people who are in the midst of these epic changes don't realize them at the time, right? Because like, it's like ironic, it's, it's, it's inversely related. Um, the bigger the transformation, the less likely you are to realize it at the time. It's the schools of historians, one of which I like a lot, they think about it in terms of, you know, oceans, where you focus on the ripples because you're up here, maybe there's some currents, but like these deep currents you don't see. And so you see the silly ripples, the pixelated cat, you don't see that it's actually tied to these functions and not just like technical functions, but these like identity functions as well, which are super powerful. Yeah, yeah you know, some, uh, something that just a thought that stirred me as you were explaining all that is you were talking about these, how powerful these symbols are. And it's, it's something that I've definitely noticed in my time in crypto and maybe haven't really explained as much to my non-crypto friends or or even the listeners of this podcast as much like it's just something that i i recognize but i don't always think about um, but i'm surrounded by them in crypto and you talked about like the people couldn't read like literally not everyone could read back then and so instead of an article, we had to show them symbols or a piece of art to convey these messages. And now uh, I almost feel like there is so much content, there's too much to read. I can't, I actually have, I use okay. Google Chrome as my browser and I use groups in my tabs. So I group my tabs by like work stuff. I have a whole research tab and it's closed right now and I just clicked it and it expanded all my tabs that I have to, like I literally have 35 plus articles that I've marked as, you gotta read this Josh, but I can't get to it. And so in a world where we do have the printing press and we're inundated with information, it seems like, are we almost reverting? You talk about that pendulum. Are we reverting back to a world where we need to be able to convey ideas, information and symbols and, and signaling in a much more short form way to be able to sift through the noise mm. that is Web 2? Man, that's that's graduate level stuff there. That's exactly right. Like literacy. <laughs> How do I want to take this? Um, 
So yeah, most people couldn't read at the time, right? Maybe 5% of the population. But literacy was like a spectrum. You could kind of make out some things. You could understand the images. Often they had these taglines, huge print that had these snappy little, you know, you can think about it like jingles and a commercial or like football or soccer or like songs or what have you. Um, and so that would like stick in your mind, right? And what happened was there was an explosion of literacy for the first time. You go from, you know, people not reading to more people reading to an explosion of content, literally hundreds of thousands of these, you know, books and tracks and what have you. While that is true, and historians of literacy will look at that and they'll say, hey, look, literacy is taking off and expanding. But at the same time, the non-literate version of the printed material, the, the image base kind of, it, it acted almost as a secondary, as an organizing rubric for you to make sense of what you're trying to read. So it's not as if there's, you know, long form discourse here and images here. Historically, counterintuitively, they actually tend to work out together and reinforce one another. And that's the same thing we're seeing now. We have an explosion of, we've lowered the bar to create, you know, from monks writing on manuscripts and illuminating them to to printing, and now another expansion, you know, Web 2, which we have some of that, but it's still kind of, you know, Fuji, because you're still going through these centralized rails, and you may have to, if you don't do that, you need to be semi-devish to be able to, you know, do some of the domain stuff. And now we're making it easier and easier and easier, so we're, we're having an explosion, and I I would predict that it's just the beginning. Like we think we've seen an information explosion, but we haven't yet. It's going to be, you know, another order to order of magnitude larger. And when you have more stuff, you actually have more of these images and like, like more of these like organizing rubrics in your head to like you can only keep so much like stuff in your head at the same uh, time. So having an image to make sense of it is actually more powerful. And then to your other point, yeah, we're surrounded with these images all the time. When it's stasis, when you're, when those images are part of like a hegemonic structure, when when they're the traditional institutions, you tend not to notice them, right? And I don't mean institutions just like banking. I mean anything like hierarchical that we use for organizing. Um, because you're just, you're used to it and it's part of your identity. You don't even think about it, right? Like you just kind of scan over it. It's like white noise. But when there's something new that comes along and it's a new idea and you say, wait, what is that? And then it's associated with the image. It may cause you to think more carefully about that. Or when it's a new image that seems weird and odd and it's attached to a new idea or a new system that may cause you to think more about that. And that's what we're seeing with crypto, all the weird kind of memes and you know what have you in the images. That was the same thing that happened at the Renaissance. They thought to the power holders, the new art was lowbrow and lo-fi and they thought it was very weird and odd, partially because it was baked into the technology and it communicated certain things you know, against the power hierarchies of the time. And that's literally what we're seeing. You know, again, it looks new and odd, and it can't just be a pixelated cat, but it's baked into the technology. And the power comes from two reasons. Like one, it's it's a function of community and identity and organizing. So that's like the the like semantic nature of the the charge. And then also, I actually, and this is a bit of a hot take, but I, I think it bears out with like historical lenses on um, the technology actually has a generative power of its own, which is crazy. We talk about consensus, and that's great, like more power to everybody. But like the technology, it's like the you know the scientist in Jurassic Park, like life finds a way. The technology actually finds a way. The decentralized nature of the technology that creates a win-win, like, you know, value, you know, like, reinforcing layers, it actually tends to, like, work out and grow, even if it doesn't have super majority or majority or even consensus to start. And so these images do something to your mental world and to your, like, financial fundamentals at the same time. And those two things, like, create a virtual loop, a virtuous cycle. You're listening to The Unstoppable Podcast the go-to place for everyone to learn about the latest innovations in Web3, NFTs, and the decentralized web. Welcome to the Metaverse.